it's never intended. You never expect the break to be that long. Um, I was I adapted a novel by Richard Russo called The Risk Pool, and I was going to do it with Tom Hanks. Hmm. And we I spent a lot of time writing that, and we were edging toward production, and then the whole thing fell apart the way these things often do. And the kind of movies that I make have become more and more difficult to get made, as you can mm. see from your local movie page. Um, and so I've worked on two or three other things during that time. I did a few, a couple of writing jobs. And then um, a couple of years ago, we started working on this and, and it took us a while to write the script and then pretty briefly to make the film. But um, yeah. but time passes uh Rapidly, there's no question about it. It's frustrating, but um, it's not a hell of a lot you can do about it. Yeah. You know, you mentioned how movies have kind of changed a bit. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is the first movie that you've done uh, that has been independently produced. And I yeah. would imagine a great number of, of your films, if you tried to make them today... That's absolutely right. ...would you have to go it. the same route, or they'd That's be exactly compromised. exactly right. You can't make them in the studio system the way... Um, I was lucky enough to come in in a period when it was possible, and I started directing at the beginning of the 80s and, and was able to make movies for 20 years in the studio system. And um, as you say, those movies simply are not made by studios anymore. So tell me if this was... Did this feel like a different filmmaking experience for you than what it's you're accustomed to? It felt different in some ways in that we had very little money and very little time. But the process is the same, and when you drive up in the morning, even though you've got this tiny little budget, you're shocked to see that you still have the trucks and you still have the people. And um, and we had the you know world class cast, and mm -hmm. these people all agreed to do this for very little money. So in that way, it wasn't different. You know, I've been really blessed to work with the best actors in the world for 30 years, and that didn't change with this low budget independent film. Well, that's what's very special about your work. It's kind of a common thread that you you assemble such exceptional ensembles in all of your films and pull such incredible performances out of such great actors. But tell, tell me what that process is. For instance, in this film, do you allow for a period where they can get to know each other and rehearse prior? Well, you know, there was a unique moment at the beginning of The Big Chill, which is in 1982, we were preparing that movie in the beginning of 83, and we actually rehearsed for four weeks, and those people who were all strangers did get to know each other, and they got to play friends after four weeks of rehearsal. I have always had some rehearsal, but never anything approaching that, and it's mm -hmm. become harder and harder as the economics of the business change. And a lot of people don't want to do rehearsal, and not me, but a lot of films have no interest in rehearsal because the directors don't really want to sit in a room with the actors and discuss the text because they haven't got a clue what the text is about anyway. You know, they just, they're just shooters. But mm -hmm. um, this film, we were able to have three days of rehearsal. Considered myself lucky for that. We didn't have everybody. But it's enormously valuable to me because... I get to hear the script. I get to hear how different people see it. It's always different than you heard it in your head. It's um, You see where there are problems. You see where things could be improved. And um, we had a little bit of that on this, but a lot of that had to happen on the fly. We, our schedule was very short. Our prep was even shorter. And um, we just had to make two. Yeah. Well, when you're... When you make a film, and even write a film, I mean, there's there's what the film is about, and then the, there's what the movie is really about, mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't discover that until after you're done shooting, yes. but what have you discovered about what this movie is really about for you? I think, you know, you're always trying to find that, and for me, movies are metaphors, and um, you're find, trying to find the metaphor that lets you talk about the things you're interested in. And um, the search for this dog was a vessel for Meg and I to talk about this issue of companionship. Now, it came out of a real experience, uh, which for me has always been the best way for these 
screenplays to work, you know. Mm-hmm. That they come out of something real that happens, and then you, as, just as you just described, you discover what they mean to you as you live through them. And um, in searching, we actually lost a dog and searched for a dog and found a dog. And then when Meg suggested we write a screenplay about it, it became a vessel, a vehicle for talking about companionship, talking about the ways that relationships can fray over time. Even the best marriage can become worn and tired if just from familiarity. Yeah. And um, we there are a lot of kind of relationships in the movie. There's a brand new marriage and there's a new exciting romantic relationship between Mark Duplass and Nyla Zur. And then there's this new relationship that starts with middle-aged people, uh, Diane Wiest and Richard Jenkins. And of course the central relationship is this marriage that has gone on for a long time where children have been raised, where the nest is emptied, and where a dog has come in and taken over some of those feelings for the Diane Keaton character and when her husband loses the dog it has a huge impact on her and it throws into relief some of the problems they're having in their marriage did you find that uh, what you were writing was kind of truthful to to what becoming a dog owner illuminated to you about yourself and your relationship definitely I was we had had a dog when the boys, we have two boys, and when they were growing up, we had a dog. And I don't think I was a terribly good dog owner. I was very concentrated on my work, and um, he came into the house sort of um, obliquely, and I don't think I ever really welcomed him into my heart. And um, he, after a period of time, he was with us for a while, and he, he passed away. We didn't have a dog for a while, and then... We considered it, and then as the boys left the house, Meg and I considered having a dog, and we avoided looking at the um, adoption sites because, you know, you labrador doc- adopt a dog a week if you look at those sites. Mm-hmm. They're just so all so appealing. But there was one dog that came through. Meg was getting notices, and this we... I looked at his face, and Meg looked at his face, and we said we had to go down and see him. He was in a shelter in South Central Los Angeles. And we went down there, and we fell in love with this dog and adopted him about seven years ago. Mm-hmm. After we'd had him for two years, and I fell in love with this dog, and we committed to him in a way I think that we had not with the earlier dog. And uh, after a couple of years, he got lost. We were in the... Rockies that we had left him there with a friend while we went to a wedding and he spooked on a hike and and got lost and um, uh, we looked everywhere for him we came back there we put up signs we went on the radio everything you see in the movie and I think that that um, I was shocked by how much I wanted that dog back and how much I cared about him how much he had entered our lives in the two Mm -hmm. years we'd had him and I, I think that's all in the movie is the surprise of really caring about some another species. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's that it's that emotional investment. Yeah. And I, I was actually going to ask you about um something related to that in terms of your writing career. Because you've you you have obviously written screenplays for your own films but also for others that have been enormously successful. But when when you write for a project that you're not directly involved in on a directorial level, is there a different kind of emotional investment involved? Yes. And I would say there's two different... I haven't done a lot of writing for other people since um, Raiders and Empire and Jedi. Mm -hmm. When I was doing those, those were my first jobs in the business, and I was still trying to become a director. But to get the opportunity to write Raiders of the Lost Ark is my first job in the business. I had sold two original screenplays by then, but that was an incredible situation to be working with George Lucas and Steven Spielberg at that time Mm -hmm. and to come up with this story and have it work out so well for everybody. Um, So I think there was no... I was was full-on absolutely committed to those things. I have done a few jobs over the years, and in this nine-year period I did a few jobs where it's not like that. 
I don't feel any cynicism about it, but it's a job of work. It's a, trying to be a professional where mm-hmm. you come in. And I've worked on a few movies that have gotten made, and I haven't even tried to get credit. Just recently, we we had the pleasure of, of welcoming Carol Littleton to the show, and that's a, that's a collaboration you've returned to something like eight or nine times. Yes. And and she was uh, incredible, obviously. She's but what an amazing co- person, one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met. What clicks between the two of you, do you think? When I was looking for an editor for Body Heat, I wanted to find a woman because the movie was so sexual and I thought it would be really helpful to have a woman's point of view when we went to cut the movie. Mm-hmm. And um, someone introduced me to Carol. She had worked with um, the hikes on French postcards and um, she knew people I knew. And the second I met her, I was totally taken with her. She was such a minch and <laughs> such a wise person. This was 30 years ago. Since then, we've done nine movies together, and I would trust her judgment on anything. She's centered, and she's full, full-hearted and uh, real. Um, she's like a wise person, and uh, it's just a joy to go in every day and sit with her and and discuss and debate what you're doing and saying what is this scene about and and she always does a you know a cut of her own and then we come in and discuss that and she's wide open to change and to constantly the constantly changing shape that a movie has and it's such a invigorating conversation to have and you have it for months yeah yeah, I, well, just one last question. I know I have to let mm-hmm. you go, but I, mm-hmm. I even I even talked to Miss Littleton about this film because it's one of my top five all time favorites, mm-hmm. and that's Accidental Tourist. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talked about kind of the delicacy of tone yes. in that movie. Was that a challenge? It was, but it was very. Um, it was an emotionally satisfying movie in every way, and. But what one of the things that changed for me forever there was that this crew, which was a fabulous crew, but they all are, really. I've been so lucky. I, I love movie crews and I'm amazed by the skills they bring every day and in all kinds of conditions. But um, that movie was so delicate. I, you're absolutely right. And the tone was so delicate. And this crew was so respectful and nurturing of that filmmaking. When it was over, I was overwhelmed, actually, by it. And I think it changed my relationship to Cruz forever. I was so taken by the sensitivity they had brought to that subject matter. Mm-hmm. So it's, an, uh, it's amazing that you asked that question because that was a seminal experience for me.